of introductions. I uh, am Arseny Chernov. You've probably seen that I started uh, as a co-organizer to this meetup. So together with uh, Han Su, um, uh, those of you that uh, uh, that know Han, he unfortunately had to leave. Uh, he's got uh, small kids. So uh, Han and I will looking for speakers for the next meetup. We also look for um, the next uh, venue sponsor. So if your company wishes to um, invite this. Uh, very honorable crowd and uh, talk to us in a short manner for a few minutes. We're very happy to uh, uh, to talk to you. Uh, I'm from Databricks. I started uh, three months ago. We are actively hiring. So also if you're looking for additional challenges in uh, AI and big data space, let me know. So I will introduce you to people and we can start uh, talking about that. Um, I am based in Singapore since 2011. I live in uh, Simi. I'm a grassroots organization member there, but uh, I also cycle to, to us, and I know a few people come from NTU today, so I'm uh, by chance sometimes dropping by. Originally, I'm from Russia, um, from St. Petersburg. There are only two seasons in St. Petersburg. If you ever plan to go to Russia, it also applies. There is July and winter, so go in July. This is just one question that everyone asked me. I wish to go to Russia. Go in July. No, any other time. And uh, I'm very, very, very big fan of Kayatos. And uh, like as a as a Singaporean in heart, I, I really enjoy uh, the cuisine here. Um, I'm currently in the partner solutions architecture role in Databricks, and I cover the entire region here. Um, my degree is in engineering, so master degree in uh, radio links television. I also work with uh, Turbo Codes. Those are like the parallel branch of. Uh, uh, deep learning, uh, deep learning networks that are uh, dedicated to signal-to-noise ratio reductions. And I previously worked for Standard Charter Bank in cloud and DevOps environment. And uh, before that, I was with EMC Isilon. This is how I got to meet uh, Spark for the first time, working with uh, Structured Data and Hadoop. And before that, with a few other vendors. Now, I wanted to set the stage for this talk, um, uh, showing you this slide, which is coming from. Uh, the paper uh, Google published in 2015, it's called the Hidden Technical Depth in Machine Learning Systems. You see the, yellow, uh, the greenish uh, dot in the middle, which says the ML code. This is actually the proportion of time Google's engineers in uh, uh, 2015, and I think still till today, spend on uh, developing the uh, uh, machine learning code, the deep learning code versus other things. What are the other things? What are the largest boxes? You can take a look and it's, you, you see that it's data collection, serving infrastructure, monitoring, process management tooling. So the actual uh, black box of the uh, hype word, the artificial intelligence, intelligence, deep learning, ML, that's a fraction of time. Most of the time, uh, Google themselves spend uh, in preparing the data, mongling the data, merging the data. So it's uh, the, reality of, um, um, the, the reality of today. So the, the current state of things is um, we live in a very siloed world, and you've seen it in Williams uh, in the previous speaker's presentation as well. So there were multiple systems involved in data preparation. Uh, they worked with, um, I, I believe, uh, they had a lot of Google Cloud Platform technologies. The previous speaker shared uh, they had uh, uh, predominantly GCP-based um, uh, uh, solutions. But um, you may you may pick up any of the uh, uh, databases, any of the uh, um, any of the storage systems as an example, and uh, they will not really closely connect with all the deep learning libraries. Deep learning libraries that are uh, able to uh, create the valuable outputs for the business are not directly connecting to those sources. So the, there are different types of systems. There are silos in between them, um, uh, and the good example is. Um, um, for example, TensorFlow that only recently started to connect to the external sources. We'll, we'll speak about that in a, in a minute. But also, um, the, the, um, the technology impacts the way that we work. And uh, by having those silos, we then organize different teams. When we organize different teams, the teams have to start to communicate to one another in a, um, s some standard manner, so they create procedures. procedures gradually slow down businesses and um, with more and more procedures with, uh, with more and more procedures businesses uh, have to go for more and more approvals uh, reviews and exceptions so the extraction of the value from the data becomes slower and slower and slower the handles here uh, on the on this slide uh, between the teams is, is usually either in jiras and uh, remember we, we've talked about 
Um, you, you've seen this slide that was presented by William. I really liked it. There was this Twitter, um, uh, a Twitter quote that said that it only takes like several hours to create the model and it takes several months to actually deploy it because you need to talk to people, create JIRAs, approve it, sign off, and then do the pull requests and actually commit it to the, uh, uh, to the masters. Um, also, by having more and more silos, you're losing the ability to analyze the, the changes, to track the uh, uh, differences. There were a lot of questions today about like, how do you see what changes to the model compared to what changes were in the data? How do you track all that? Well, you have multiple systems, multiple silos, multiple teams. You completely uh, lose this visibility. And definitely different infrastructure. Um, with, only, with only five systems I've, co I've counted in the previous speakers, um, presentation, uh, you still can kind of live, but in production, um, for example, on-premise environments or heterogeneous environments, you may end up with like 15 or 20 of them. So um, the data, though, uh, keeps on emerging, and there's a variability of data that, uh, um, th th that grows in different kinds and velocities and types. And the um, uh, current idea behind Project Hydrogen, which is the Apache Spark version 2.4, <laughs> Uh, is to start to unify these two worlds together, to start breaking down these silos in between big data processing and machine learning. So uh, with all the connectors that uh, Spark has, and Spark has 50 plus uh, quite stable and fast connectors to different storage types, including streaming um, um, batch, and uh, uh, even like you can connect to Elasticsearch. Someone, uh, someone asked me today earlier in the day, like, can we use Elasticsearch? Yes, you actually can connect Spark to Elastic and uh, query Elastic as, as you wish to. With all the capabilities that Spark already has, there are just few things that needed to be solved that uh, would unify the, um, uh, the uh, portion about um, uh, the total platform that is, would be capable to do the distributed learning, AI, and the data prep. Um, so there's, there's actually two thoughts. Um, let me make sure, I'm trying to skip a little bit. Um, I think this is, the, um, this is the history of how a lot of projects that we're all acquainted with uh, emerged and developed over the uh, last several years. So you can see on the left-hand side, the um, Spark community started with uh, the, um, where, where Spark started was the MapReduce in memory, just the speeding up MapReduce, avoiding usage of the disks and being able to process large sets of data in a distributed fashion really quickly. And it started with the RDD API. It was like a very, very new API. No one was really figuring out how to um, quickly write a new code for it. And then it started to, uh, to adopt more uh, libraries and APIs to simplify the usage of Spark. So first the uh, APIs in Python, in Java, in R started to appear. Then there was the new concept called the data frame that appeared and it uh, made it very easy. It was, uh, um, uh, it, it was a, it, the unification uh, single um, common denominator, the, the, the unifying pit uh, that allowed a lot of different skills uh, from different types of background uh, working in uh, one team to use the same execution platform. So the person with uh, Python background or with Java background or with uh, R background are now able to use Spark and uh, uh, teach one another, share the skills. So that, that gradually went into the um, uh, Spark, uh, Spark, in Spark's uh, history, in Spark's roadmap, but gradually into that, that gradually went into the production shipping code that was uh, ready and the one that you probably use right now. Um, it then uh, was, was uh, extended by structured streaming. So uh, one other interface that uh, um, is, was available in Spark from very early days was the SQL interface. So you can actually query Spark just as if you would query the regular SQL, um, uh, uh, NC SQL standard uh, database. So you can query uh, it using SQL, and then on top of SQL, this structured streaming API appeared, which was uh, the same um, approach, but to the micro batches. Instead of querying the huge data sets, you split them into small, tiny pieces, and then within each, you can look at them from the perspective of like a second batch interval, micro batching interval. So this is how you work with the streaming data in Spark. At the same time, in the AI and ML community, um, there, there were the same uh, developments. So there were first foundational projects like Pandas and NumPy 
And on top of that, there were some uh, performance optimization uh, projects that appeared like XGBoost, uh, GLMNet. Uh, then there was a fundamental uh, big development by the team behind Scikit-Learn. And uh, slowly, gradually, we appeared to the uh, uh, TensorFlow's um, uh, beginnings. Then TensorFlow was uh, a little bit too um, low level for many of the data scientists. So um, then Kara started to simplify the way that the TensorFlow models are ran. So it uh, allowed to create the layers in the uh, neural networks in a much easier, much simpler way, although below the scenes using TensorFlow. So you can see that it's all about converging and definitely then there is, uh, there is a side, side project in TensorFlow that allows uh, to access the data right now, it's called tf.data, tf.transform. So it all kind of converges into simplification and the ease of use. And uh, what's next, the big uh, double, uh, the two question mark is, uh, we don't know, time will show, but it looks like it all converges into something that would be the best of the two worlds together and the community start to speak in between, one, uh, in between each other. That's, uh, uh, that's something we observe. The reason why these communities need to speak is because, uh, as you know, Spark is very popular for big data processing, for ETL, for distributed, um, very distributed. We're speaking about like hundreds of thousand cores participating in, like, uh, uh, in, in some jobs that uh, one of the largest customers of, uh, of Databricks run. Um, we, we speak about uh, processing large amount of data, which is very beneficial for DL, for distributed learning. So this, um, um, uh, this picture is actually coming from a research paper uh, presentation um, from Stanford. And uh, you can see that the, um, uh, efforts, uh, the efforts you put into feeding your neural net uh, with uh, more and more data, they actually pay off with the performance of the model. So the more you can allow, the more you can allow to train, the more data you can allow to pass to the, uh, to the model, um, pays off uh, overall in the, uh, um, uh, in, the models, uh, in the model's performance and the um, model's accuracy. So there were a lot of um, pro uh, projects that uh, were trying to blend the two. They are not entirely unique to Apache Spark community. So projects, for example, Intel had Big DL that tried to um, do the distributed uh, uh, deep learning using Intel CPUs and leverage them better. Uh, there were several pro uh, there were several projects from, uh, for example, Yahoo. Uh, there were Cafe on Spark, TensorFlow on Spark, and uh, uh, you, you, you may actually find a lot of uh, semi-orphan packages on sparkpackages.org that are trying to do the same thing. So, kind of, for example, run, the, um, run Spark uh, with TensorFlow in a distributed manner, but then people basically gave up after like first uh, several, several commits. So um, definitely <coughs> take a look at, um, at all these projects. Uh, if, you have, uh, um, if, if you have interest in, uh, in, in how they develop and where they stop, but uh, what really we're interested in is um, uh, two use cases to be solved, two user stories, and they come from uh, a data scientist perspective. So a data scientist wants to build a pipeline that uh, takes training events from a production data warehouse where the uh, uh, downstream kind of data lake ends up and train the model in parallel and uh, also apply this model to uh, already trained model to, um, to extract value from the, from, from the same production data. So basically start inferring it in parallel into the distributed event stream that uh, is already working there. So you've seen in uh, previous, um, in previous presentation uh, of the previous speaker, there's a, a whole deployment um, on top of Kubernetes that uh, they have to work with by start starting in a completely different um, uh, in a completely different source of the data, working with different siloed systems, it all, and all ends up in Kubernetes in the end. Um, this is uh, uh, this is the example of how segregated different infrastructure um, layers in that environment are, and uh, the user story is having a. The, the, the users want simplification, so the user's story is to have one system that allows to do both of these things. So when we speak, um, when we speak about the uh, 
distributed training. This is the uh, reinforcement of the same user story. So we want to load the data from multiple different uh, data types. And uh, Apache Spark is one of the best solutions uh, for this user story. And then at the same time, we want to fit the, um, the model, train the model, and do it in a distributed way. And there are multiple frameworks using GPUs uh, right now. For example, Horovod for distributed TensorFlow. Um, and they are uh, then giving us the model that we want to productionize. And when we have a productionized model, what we want to do is we want to have a live stream of data that um, uh, we, we, we connect the model to. But as I mentioned, there is a disconnect. For example, Horobo does not allow you to read directly through Kafka. So um, you have to create some sort of interim uh, sync, some sort of interim uh, uh, some sort of interim load step and uh, also orchestrate this um, connectivity with uh, some scripting, some additional engineering solutions, some uh, CI CD pipelines that are not essential for your um, extraction of um, e e extraction of the features for example. So um, the, um, the afterthought for that is the glue code that uh, uh, we also seen in the previous presentation. So there's uh, quite a lot of um, quite a lot of orchestrating uh, non-valuable projects that emerge, and they are sometimes uh, maintained by engineering in larger organization. They are uh, they are maintained by the same data engineering team. Sometimes they are um, outsourced, but that um, connection is right now not uh, not realized natively in one platform. The reason why we cannot really we were not able to really realize the same um, <coughs> realize all both the uh, working with the big data and the distributed training on spark before version 2.4 is just the way the the tasks are scheduled originally in uh, spark native scheduler uh, spark is known for its uh, so-called embarrassingly parallel uh, task scheduling so when uh, we have um, uh, a big data set we partition it in, uh, into multiple partitions and then we let each individual uh, compute unit of the, uh, uh, of the Spark cluster work on its own portion and uh, if that um, particular uh, worker, they're called workers, if that particular worker fails due to some reason um, the task is getting restarted and it does not impact the other tasks. It's the idea behind um, um, behind embarrassingly parallel uh, scheduling on top of Apache Spark. Now what is needed in distributed training is a little bit different. So to illustrate the task failure um, in um, our first distributed um, system, which was uh, the embarrassingly parallel scheduling, um, we, we have a green task that uh, crashed and uh, it did not impact um, anything because it was um, designed from day one to be uh, tolerant to, to uh, system partitioning. In distributed system you actually have to restart all the tasks together because they significantly rely on one another to communicate the proceeds um, <coughs> to, to communicate the um, to, to shuffle the data between them to update them on the stages of their job so you cannot really restart only one task in a distributed uh, learning distributed, uh, distributed uh, TensorFlow system for example. You need to restart all of them and uh, that implies that we need a different type of scheduling um, so the solution to this um, is something that was introduced in uh, version 2.4 in Apache Spark. It, it happened uh, several months ago and it's something called uh, barrier execution mode. So if you go into the um, Spark's, um, Spark's homepage, um, you may find all the release uh, notes always on the um, Apache Spark project and then it's the top feature about this release. So it says that this release adds a uh, barrier execution mode for better integration with deep learning frameworks um, and uh, introduces some additional higher end functions um, inside this mode. But not only that, there's also some um, improvement in uh, uh, Spark 2.4 uh, that allows to um, use the user defined functions um, uh, in a much faster way. Uh, that's something that is uh, labeled under the epic called uh, optimized data exchange and uh, the last but not least uh, 
there is a, a, new, um, a new way to, it's only right now available in uh, Spark's own standalone scheduler. There is a new way to communicate the capabilities of um, uh, workers, of the compute elements in Spark cluster, so that your task that you schedule on top of Spark cluster is aware about the underlying hardware. So it's aware, for example, that uh, there is a GPU of a certain type or um, so on and so forth. So these are incremental improvements in uh, um, 2.4 in, uh, uh, in, uh, in an old group of them is uh, sometimes referred to as the project hydrogen. So this is the, uh, the idea behind it. Um, I will demonstrate a little bit more about the barrier execution mode. Um, but um, the idea is uh, uh, in, uh, in the scheduler, in the mathematical, um, in, the, in the theory of scheduling, uh, there is something called the gang execution. So the uh, gang scheduling, gang execution is like uh, either, one, uh, either one whole gang of people, like, you know, adversaries, yeah, they go and do something really criminal, <laughs> or no one does. So that's the idea behind uh, the barrier execution mode. Um, the realization, um, you, can, um, you can take a, a, a deeper read about the EPIC, uh, there's this uh, big JIRA that went into the release note. Um, uh, the idea behind it is to allow to start all the tasks in uh, uh, Spark from some point only from uh, the simultaneous perspective and we'll wait for all of these tasks to complete and then get back into the embarrassingly parallel. You still operate in the regular um, Spark uh, mentality, but from some point onwards, you just say, from here, start all tasks together and uh, um, look at the uh, way that this set of procedures is executed. And once they're all completed, uh, come back to the regular scheduling. And also it allows to establish a context for the other jobs to be aware what's actually scheduled inside this barrier. And uh, I think it will be um, uh, a little bit clearer when we, uh, when we go into the demo, but uh, it, uh, the APIs to barrier mode is so, for, uh, is so far realized in Scala and Python. So there is nothing like that in SQL. Um, if you want to like call out for the uh, use a defined function or something like that across um, across a data set. You're you're still bound to Scala and Python for so for 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 now. Um, you have inside the context uh, for a particular RDD. Sorry, sorry, inside the barrier for a particular RDD, you have uh, some additional functions that you can call. For example, you can call like for the IP addresses of the workers that are currently um, scheduling, that are currently executing the tasks in parallel. So you something like creating a cluster within a cluster that only does a distributed gang execution um, job. So um, I'll, I'll go forward and uh, uh, demo it in a little bit later. Let's skip this one. Yes, yeah, so you you uh, you are able. For example, here is uh, it's important. For example, an API in uh, in uh, um, an MPI. MPI is uh, um, the way uh, that in in TensorFlow, for example, you start the distributed learning. You have uh, in TensorFlow you have uh, one single master host, and then you run you designate it. It could be not aligned to the regular master host, the so-called driver in Spark. It could be actually um, quite different and you need to to be able to execute the TensorFlow job you need to be aware about the for example IP addresses of the uh, hosts participating in the distributed TensorFlow job so um, you are able to pull and uh, get the information about that so, sort of like cluster inside the cluster you're able to get um, uh, get that information through the context within the barrier um, and then launch the usual MPI, uh, uh, launch the TensorFlow in the usual MPI way. Um, so, so far, as I mentioned, it's only in the standalone, but there are already, you may see that there are several uh, tickets, several, uh, several, um, uh, several initiatives to talk to the other schedulers where uh, Spark is executed, for example, to uh, Yarn, to Kubernetes, to Mesos, to also allow this information to get cascaded back into the um, Spark environment to um, 
create the parity in the uh, project hydrogen. Um, speaking about optimized data exchange, uh, optimized data exchange is uh, um, when you have a particular spark type data, and usually it's represented by um, uh, the data frame API. You, you read um, with all those 50 connectors, uh, you read the data into the data frame API. It's very convenient to work with it. There are very simple functions to uh, change the data, to expand it, to enrich it, to extract features out of it. But uh, most of the deep learning frameworks, they operate in a different data uh, types. Usually they are uh, native to Python. They, uh, they are not aware about the data frame API format. So one of the things that uh, could be done definitely is just to write it out, <laughs> wait for the write operation com to complete, and then read it back, which is a waste of um, um, which is a waste of time, waste of energy because Spark operates very fast uh, um, and it's uh, optimized to be working completely in memory without touching the disk. So that's uh, not a good idea. Um, the uh, usual approach is to call uh, the um, transformation to um, the particular set of data, like for example for one row out of a huge one, um, and uh, then pass it over to Python in the call using the user-defined function. So the, um, the calls uh, to TensorFlow, for example, in, uh, in Spark, they are also done against uh, the data uh, invoking uh, invoking uh, invoking the data using the user-defined functions, and uh, the problem with user-defined functions they were introduced quite uh, um, quite a few years ago. I think it was two years ago. Spark uh, 2.2. The problem with that is uh, the latency of um, taking a single row of a huge data set and uh, converting it, and then working on it in Python world and then returning it into uh, Spark, and then, for example, writing it out with all, uh, with all the possibilities that Spark has, or acting at it, uh, at this data, um, as if it's a streaming data. Um, and when we speak about um, latency, the measurements that were done uh, is uh, about 92%, 90% to 98%, this was the, the estimation, is the exchange of the data formats versus the actual execution of the Python code. Um, this is just the difference in between the, uh, the data types inside uh, Spark natively and the world of Python, where this, most of the distributed learning libraries operate. So um, the Project Hydrogen's initiative about the, um, the, the, the optimization to this problem is to introduce the vectorized uh, data exchange and the idea behind it is to send the column. So it's uh, similar to column in a database or columnar exchange. So um, uh, the user-defined function is executed against a set of columns. So why don't we send the entire column out of the data set that already has been um, prepared, featureized, and uh, uh, um, uh, stays in memory of um, Apache Spark cluster? Why don't we send the entire column of this data into Python UDF and then wait for it uh, to return and then merge it backward? So the, um, uh, the uh, kind of behind the scene realization of uh, this um, initiative was done using the Arrow. Uh, the community behind Apache Arrow actually uh, has a lot of different transformations already and they had uh, established like the framework for different other Apache projects to start using it. So Spark project just uh, partnered with them and uh, leveraged the transformations that Arrow has behind the scenes to speed, to speed things up. Um, so when you call the <coughs> when you call the uh, two pandas RD or two Arrow RDD as the uh, user defined function. Um, Spark handles it uh, transparently for you in that columnar manner, so you're not wasting. And, and when I would say Spark, I, I mean Spark 2.4. Um, Project Hydrogen handles it for you in the transparent manner. It happens all behind the scenes. And um, uh, the reusage um, of the uh, already established protocols by Arrow community 
and also some additional engineering that was uh, done by Apache Spark emitters allowed to improve the calls to use defined functions like 200-fold, 300-fold. So you can see the um, comparison between a row at a time call to the user defined function versus the uh, call to um, the pandas UDF with the vectorized columnar um, uh, vectorized columnar format and uh, yeah and different um, uh, lambda functions were used like lambda plus one or uh, do subtract mean for example from a single column um, so I want to switch to a very quick demonstration of the barrier mode. I think it's uh, one of the very most very important aspects that uh, uh, is there in uh, uh, 2.4. So I have a couple of notebooks here, and uh, I want to um, um, want to show you guys uh, also the. Is this uh, UI familiar for you? You you guys can, can you raise your hands who've seen uh, Databricks UI before? Because I know it's an Apache Spark meetup, so. Can you raise your hand if you've seen Apache? Okay, Databricks UI, who's seen it? Yay, quite a number of people. That's pretty cool, thank you. Um, so the idea behind it, for those that didn't raise hand, is um, we, uh, at Databricks, uh, we are uh, shipping the uh, unified analytics platform, which only works on the cloud, so you cannot install Databricks on-premise. But the idea behind it is it's a collaborative notebook space that is a very, uh, a very powerful way for people to work the code together. Um, and behind the scenes, there is its, uh, its own cloud native cloud optimized scheduler and an Apache Spark core fundamental uh, with additional optimizations to work with uh, connectors uh, with, with, with um, native uh, Azure, Microsoft Azure storage types uh, with uh, native uh, AWS storage types and um, additional optimizations from the performance. So that's very like 10 second <laughs> explanation of what is Databricks for those that uh, are not aware. So you see the notebooks in here. Um, I wanted to, um, when, when you go into the notebooks, you have to attach them as usually in Zeppelin. Zeppelin notebooks, can you raise your hands? Yeah? Okay, some of you use it. So you attach the notebooks to the cluster so you can execute some jobs, you, um, you, you connect the code to the execution um, on top of a particular cluster by, uh, by, um, by attaching them. So I have a cluster that has several, um, uh, at this point this is a, a, a native US environment and it has uh, four worker nodes, each one has one GPU and uh, 60 gigabytes of memory. Um, the uh, notebooks attached to it, let's go into this first one, distributed training, are executing some Spark code to do um, distributed learning um, using Horrible. Uh, this is the regular MNIST example. Anyone remembers the MNIST, the digits recognition samples? Okay, sorry, it's the first time that I'm uh, uh, at this meetup, so I'm trying to gauge the, uh, um, the audience awareness, that's good. So the idea behind this is we have uh, a set of numbers and they've already been captured as uh, uh, pixels, like in a, uh, in a picture you have every black and white um, uh, dot and uh, you can create a long, um, a long list of um, rows in a very large database to represent the graphical data set on top. And then you can pass it to Horrible to train it against the label set to train the model and uh, uh, to, know, uh, to, to, um, to then output the predictions. So we have a table already. Uh, the table has, uh, if we go into the, uh, I need to show you, I guess, the, the table with the digits. So, you, do, so you, you trust me, you don't just take my word for granted. So if we go into Hello World, no, Horrible. Hydrogen, MNIST. This is what every individual digit looks like. So these are, zeros are like black dots, and then there are like the other um, the other grades of uh, uh, gray. So if we uh, start the job and train the Horvath model using all the four nodes, let me just run them all. What happens here? We repartition. We read in the um, we read in the entire table into the Spark um, data frame. 
So that data frame is then repartitioned into uh, two partitions. And in Spark, the uh, amount of rows in, uh, it, you have a huge data set, you partition it into um, t uh, smaller chunks and then um, this is the actual scope of work for every individual uh, Spark um, executor, the work of the compute unit. So right now I expect that there will be two executors actually working on the data set. I write it out into um, an intermediate format here and then I execute the um, a function uh, against that data set uh, that works on all uh, that works on two hosts. So let's see. We need to um, take a look at this stage. Okay, so we, we, we have a job, um, job stage one, which is just kicked off. I'm just waiting for the um, second stage. It might take a little bit longer, but actually it wouldn't, wouldn't care. Um, if I run at the same time, what I want to do is like, I want to uh, use the same cluster for something in parallel. And uh, I'm not using any barrier execution mode here. I'm just trying to infer the model that I already have and it's hidden in uh, one, of, one of these uh, functions, uh, predict using GPU. Um, I want to um, infer a, um, a model against the live stream of data that, uh, in this case, it's uh, simulated uh, against the column that will be uh, the features. And I want to create another, um, I want to create another column in the same data frame, calling it a prediction to what actually this digit means, the hand, rec hand recognized uh, um, a digit. And then I will call an action to display. So what I'm ideally looking at is a, a two, column, um, chart, a two column table that has the label originally seen. And then based on the columns in the feature, uh, based on the column of the features, the prediction to what the uh, real time machine learning algorithm would, uh, would apply to it. So if I kick it off by running it all. And here, like in these uh, utils are all of these smaller functions, actually, they are all hidden. So I'm expecting the stream to actually fail. So let's uh, see. And the reason for that is that I'm trying to schedule four, there are four nodes in this cluster, four GPUs. And I'm trying to schedule. Yeah, it took a little bit longer than I anticipated. This is complete. Yeah, I've, 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 I've run out of time. I need to, I guess, uh, like I, I, I took it a little bit longer. The, let, let me actually stop this job and just rerun it for you for a second. So um, that happens when you're trying to do the live demo sometimes. And uh, that's, a, that's a real cluster behind it. I think what happened is the previous job uh, commenced uh, much earlier than I anticipated in the GPU cycle. So let me, uh, what I need to do is I'll clear it all and uh, restart it in a second. So um, don't, don't take my word for, um, for it. The idea behind it is the job, as I anticipated, has to fail here because it will try to uh, use all the GPUs available in this cluster, and there are four of them, against the same, um, data, uh, against the same uh, to, to, to run this test. And two of them would actually be already occupied running the previous uh, notebook. So let me clear it all up. Um, there is this function, very, very helpful function that is called the kill all API, just in case there is something yet running on the cluster. <laughs> yep, so let's kick this job off once more. 
doing the prep work, reading in the table with the digits, um, repartitioning them, writing it into the Parquet format, and then reading it the same, um, re reading this Parquet database uh, with the model. Oh yeah, there we go. So I think yeah, what what happened is just I was a little bit too quick for that. So you can see the usual startup sequence of the TensorFlow here. Um, it does have a lot of details inside. We will not go into it, but basically right now I'm trying to I'm training the model on the four-node cluster. And if we look at the uh, event timeline here, and we enable zooming. So these are the two on the back of it. These are the two workers that were selected and run uh, the two partitions. Uh, repartition two. They run it against the GPUs. So if we go back into the modal inference without the barrier mode execution and we just say, okay, run um, on all available nodes without any awareness about the barrier mode. Um, run this code and infer the modal that already exists against the uh, live stream of data. So what it would try to do, it would try to infer also on those nodes that are already already got the GPU occupied because it tries to schedule sh four tasks. And at this point it should fail. I want it to fail. Yay. This is the kind of like the opposite example of the usual demo expectations. You really don't want to things for, to, for things to fail. So it fails with the uh, yeah, anticipated GPU occupied error. And the idea is we're, we're, like, we're actually not able to complete the, the task that Spark wants because underneath the hood, um, below the hood there is already GPU busy. So um, let's stop it all. Uh, let's actually go back to this job, clear it all and uh, clear all the possibly running MPI jobs by killing them all. So if we repeat the same experiment with the barrier mode now, the only thing that was added is this. So it says also repartition the same data set into two, but create a barrier for these tasks and distribute the information that you are using these two hosts for the distributed learning deep, uh, for distributed deep learning uh, scenario, distribute the information to anyone who is interested to schedule any jobs in parallel. So it's a cluster inside the cluster. So let's run, let's run this. Let's take a look at the execution. So you can see that we because there are two partitions to the training set. So yeah, right now there is a, yeah two tasks going on. And if I'm running the modal inference that is aware about the barrier context, um, I actually don't do anything. So Spark does it for me. So once I created the barrier for the two tasks in my previous parallel job, the other jobs that I schedule on this cluster, they will be aware which nodes are currently occupying the uh, GPUs. So when I'm using the uh, different notebooks, in this case, I'm still doing the same. I'm reading the stream um, and for the every micro batch that I read, I'm inferring it using the UDF. Uh, UDF. So now I don't want it to fail. So yeah, you can see the number two and number eight in this notebook. And number nine and number 10 are different executors that were picked up. So we scheduled, uh, although we had the, in Spark mind, we had all the nodes available for scheduling, we only scheduled two because we were aware that there is a barrier con concurrently doing something on the GPU enabled hosts. So that's the idea of the barrier mode. 
and it just appeared like it's uh, like two months uh, they released uh, 2.4 in uh, in November the first talks about uh, and I'm not the author of the presentation the first talks were actually by the committers uh, like late summer they were talking about that so just wanted to uh, to introduce this concept of the barrier execution mode too this is the beginning of a very uh, big progress because you're now able to mix and match the power of Spark with the nature of the distributed deep learning. And uh, the last bit is the accelerator aware scheduling. It's still in discussion, so you can see it's uh, marked as the pending vote here. Um, the idea behind it is you can um, only specify those particular type of GPU or uh, some technical, uh, some, some um, some capabilities of the host uh, for further actions that you execute in Spark cluster. And it will execute these tasks only on those hosts that uh, conform to this criteria. But it's again like it's scheduling, um, it's actually uh, very dependent on the scheduler. So there is a work going on uh, to talk to the Mesos community, to Kubernetes community, and to Yarn community to actually make it happen, to make this awareness uh, presented back into Spark. And the timeline, um, right now we have the barrier execution mode, uh, and it's available uh, straight out. You can also play around with it on Databricks platform. Um, the next big steps will be to integrate more and more functions into the barrier execution mode to make it more easy, for example, to pull out the uh, additional context information. And then going forward in Spark 3.0, there will be um, um, optimized data exchange and uh, the completion of the accelerator aware scheduling. So that's the nature of the uh, project Hydrogen. It shows you why we actually are rebranding this um, just Apache Spark meetup to Spark and AI meetup because it's now getting into uh, the single unified platform that merges the best of the two worlds together. Um, I know I was um, um, running a little bit short of time and we actually are supposed to end five minutes ago, but still if you, if you guys have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to address those.